what I'm going to do is I'm going to really talk about the learning that we've had over the last few years uh, investigating real performance of low energy dwellings. As we know that you know UK is now kind of signed up to a carbon neutrality by 2050 and housing performance is, is kind of the cornerstone of that. Um, we certainly need to avoid pitfalls that we have in designing and operating low energy dwellings and that's what I kind of want to emphasize. Uh, I do want the message to be, be a bit worried, but I also want the message to be that let's kind of transform what is there. Um, okay, so I'll give a bit of context, a uh, bit of this, this thing about design and aspect performance, and then in-use performance, and some final thoughts. A uh, little bit about my group. So I, I run the Low Carbon Building Group in Oxford Brooks. So for the last kind of 15 years, we've been doing a lot of work in different areas, whether it's mapping communities, in terms of carbon emissions or running advanced low carbon retrofits. As a professor of architecture, I've been very interested in doing things and then evaluating them. Our key area of work is building performance evaluation. So I had helped to set up the Innovate UK building performance evaluation program with other colleagues and I was an evaluator on that, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm increasingly involved in smart local energy systems. So looking at energy flexibility and other things and a lot on climate adaptation. Um, and I've wor I'm working a lot in uh, non-OECD countries, such as India, where I'm now uh, running an EPSRC project called Reside, which is uh, developing the residential energy code for a country which will build 100 million homes in 10 years. So you can see the impact of that, what we from the planet. And we're trying to kind of monitor 2,000 homes across the country at the moment to kind of build a data-driven code. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is building performance, because I think that's uh, important and necessary to understand as we head towards you know, the zero emission target. I think the main problem I want to address or the main challenge that we have is that we have a lot of leads, we have a lot of Brian, we have a lot of energy stars and green stars, but what we don't have that much is idea and evidence about real performance. And this is a major problem now in the building sector where there's a growing gap between what we design versus what we get. Typically, the building sector has, uh, you know, has been producing buildings which could use up to 400% more energy than what they're designed for. In any other sector that I know of, that would be acceptable. Think of line. One in four chance of getting out of the plane you're on wouldn't be acceptable. In the building sector, it is. Especially when we look at homes, which is probably the single most important investment of someone's life. Um, we get this kind of gap because of modeling issues, the assumptions that are made because of the way dwellings are built, occupied, or commissioned, handed over and occupied. Um, and there have been a lot of building performance evaluation studies to kind of identify that. And I was pleased to see there are quite a few papers in the conference looking at that uh, in terms of what are the causes, fine-tuned performance, and informing future design. But what we find, most of them tend to focus on as-built very few focus on the in-use bit. Um, and largely, they are case study based, which they need to be. But the problem with case study based approach is that policymakers find it hard to generalize from it. And that's a challenge that we've been trying to address. Um, and also the fact that occupants matter, and we can't kind of ignore that. Uh, unfortunately, building regulations stop here which is as built performance, assuming there are no occupants, whereas buildings are meant for occupants. So, you know, we should be looking at outcomes, not, not just as built performance. So we set out to kind of look at this meta study because, uh, as I was presenting in the previous session, we've been developing an insurance product to address performance gap, to kind of ensure housing performance. And before that, we have to do a whole lot of meta study to really see what's out there. Um, so in, in the UK, there's, there's a, uh, our innovation agency is called Innovate UK, which funded this program uh, called Building Forms Evaluation some years back. It was an 8 million pound program which looked at a large number of projects. And we looked at that data to find out um, for low energy housing, so because it was a competition, all the projects here are ultra low energy. So they're passive houses and non-passive houses. And the non-passive houses are also port level 6, 5, very advanced, very passive houses actually sometimes, because that was the requirement of the competition. So you're really looking at a sample in the population of new build, which is high performing in, in design. So we wanted to look at what's the magnitude and extent of that performance gap, 
and what is the influence of occupancy related factors because we know little about that you know, using statistical analysis for instance uh, there are about 53 projects covering 350 dwellings which which represent about 3500 dwellings across the developments so it's quite a large kind of a data set uh, and social housing tends to dominate it but there is also you know, private housing so that's the distribution of that data set where you have a, a mix of passive and non-passive. NPH is non-passive, passive house is PH. But just to be clear, the non-passive houses are also very low energy. They are not the conventional bed forms. And there's a mix, so you can see the ventilation strategy is a mix of mechanical ventilation, heat recovery with mechanical extract. Uh, they are um, you know, timber frame or masonry or even some are concrete. Um, the tenure tends to be mixed, but primarily social housing and then the mix of houses, flats, bungalows. So there's a good mix. It's not representing the population. It was never designed to be. It's a, it's a selected sample. Essentially, people who knew how to write good applications, let's be honest. It was a competition and you know, people who kind of won it. And as a group of evaluators that we were, we kind of studied you know, these projects. So um, in terms of as design and as built performance, we had good data for 188 dwellings. So we had data about the building fabric. As we head towards in use, good data were available for about 92 dwellings, a third of which were passive house and the other were non-passive houses. And here we had uh, about 50 passive houses in the 188 and the remaining non-passive houses. So it's a reasonably large database and because uh, it's a meta study, the bias from the research is very less because we haven't done it ourselves, we've just analyzed it. There were a series of techniques, so you know most of you will be familiar with them. They looked at fabric, whether it was looking at co-heating tests or commissioning, or looking at design audits, construction audits, or even looking at in-use performance, energy, environment. Um, so when I talk about that kind of data, it's every five minute data that were available. Also looking at user satisfaction, other things. So there was a range of socio-technical methods that were used. Um, but let's come to the results because that's what's interesting. So let's compare the first look at the as-built performance, so no occupants. And we focus on the fabric here. Um, so red is measured if it's red or whatever, or the bluish is the designed in all the graphs. Okay, so the first thing that strikes you, and I've kept passive houses on the left hand side and non-passive houses on the right hand side of all the graphs, and there's a there's a division there. So what strikes first is that there is a performance gap uh, in the air permeability uh, levels. In passive houses, it's it's lower. It's about 0.5. In non-passive houses, it's nearly two. So um, think of that if you put that, that in the model again, how would the energy use change? But I don't want to be too negative here because the average is about four, uh, which is better than the building regs, which is around 10. So the, the, the overall average is okay, but when you compare it against their own design intent, most of them do not seem to meet their design intent which in a very simple indicator, air permeability, which is pretty ubiquitous and done you know, uh, quite regularly, and this is about 188 dwellings. We then kind of compared design and measured air permeability, and as you would expect, passive houses are here, so that's that's the group, passive houses, but the rest of them, there's not much correlation. It's quite weak, um, which is interesting in itself. Uh, we then looked at the U values, because we had measured and designed U values, and again, you can see with the red one, there is a bit of a difference, but it's, it's not that big for passive houses, about 0 0.03 watts per meter square Kelvin, more, almost double for non-passive houses. Um, and this could go up to quite high for certain dwellings, the difference can be high, but more or less they were not that bad, I think. There were some issues which we uh, tried to look at. In terms of you know the whole house heat loss coefficient, which is becoming quite an important indicator of the real performance real thermal performance of housing, um, about 18% was how the dwellings were, you know, the measured performance was higher than, than the design performance. Um, if you compare between passive and non-passive, there's a big difference. So passive houses, which are supposed to be designed to have uh, very high thermal performance, are, are there, you know, they have a discrepancy of 2.5 watts per Kelvin, about 10 times worse than non-passive houses. So I think there is something to learn here, that what passive house is doing is because of the principles that are followed in terms of um, the, uh, work, workmanship and quality regime, that, that's showing here. So certainly with the aspect performance, you can see passive houses are outperforming you know, those which are not passive houses. We looked at a bit more in detail, 
in terms of what were the issues. So without going into detail that much, we found that they were most of the dominant issues were around windows and doors, how they are fixed. And then followed by you know, uh, all the junction and joints, whether it was roofs, eaves, loft spaces, and then the others. Um, and that's evident in the photographs. So you can see how windows are fixed. You can see door thresholds and how doors are kind of not fixed properly. Um, and then a bit on the roof eaves and the lofts. We were trying to see you know, why that, that difference was there. But what became quite apparent from this analysis was that there was a thermal performance gap you know, in passive houses, but the magnitude was much lower than the non-passive houses. Um, the second bit was, I think, more interesting, where you look at the in-use performance. And that um, analysis has not been done that much across the world. So I think it's quite new. Um, in terms of the in-use performance, we had 92 dwellings. We didn't have 188. There weren't good data, and that itself is something interesting. The first thing is that energy use, on average, is about 103 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And now I'm talking about actual energy use, not designed. Um, the passive house dwellings are 60% less than the non-passive houses. Um, overall, this sample is doing well, because the UK building rights that time was 183, and this, the UK with the overall average of the sample was much better. But what's interesting is that, just remember these figures, 117 for non-passive houses and 73 kilowatt hours per square meter per year for passive houses. When you compare measured with predicted performance, things become really interesting. So again, measured is the reddish pink one, the, the greenish color is the predicted one. And performance gap is, is dominant, you know, so measured energy use tends to be higher than the predicted energy use. There was no statistical relationship when you plot measured and predicted, which I think is also interesting in itself. And this is the performance gap that you get in a passive house, about 22 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And in a non-passive house, it's double. So that kind of information is very useful to feed back into the model, to really see what, what happens. Um, so performance gap is there. You know, It's certainly there in these high-performing competition return to kind of uh, home, so you know what is happening in the population. Then we looked at this by energy vector, because uh, it's important to kind of go deeper. Certainly passive houses are doing better than non-passive houses, but there's still some interesting findings. So I'm, I'm putting all the energy vectors here, irrespective of what their carbon footprint is, because I want to show what the energy footprint is. So you've had fossil fuel, biomass, and electricity predominantly, and what we find here is that passive houses are using much lower fossil fuel, which you would expect, than non-passive houses, but the electricity use is, is pretty high. So this is proportion, I'll show you the actual figures in a bit. But 48% of whatever that is, you know, uh, 73. Uh, and the NPA, and you get to look at this, the electricity use between passive and non-passive houses is not very different. It's 47 and 55. The passive houses are using a lot of electricity for uh, driving air around the house. Um, we then kind of looked at in further detail by end use and that's quite hard to kind of analyze and you can see the sample is going small because you know not every dwelling will provide that data which is great but and the first thing that kind of strikes you is that space heating even in passive houses is a pretty good proportion and non-passive houses is about 50 uh, you can see it's about you know 42 uh, percent and then passive houses is about 28 percent but what is striking is that when you look at hot water, that doesn't change across the both types. So domestic hot water use is no different in a passive house as it is in a non-passive house. And I think that's really interesting. So if somebody asks me where should the next research challenge be, I think it's domestic hot water. It's hardly any of these homes had solar thermal, and those that had didn't really work well. Um, and you can see that if you combine just space heating and hot water, which are the two end uses which are heavily regulated by building regulations. There are about 63% in a non-passive house, and half of energy in a passive house is still used for space heating and hot water. And I think that's really interesting. And it compares UK average is about 80%. So they certainly do better than the UK average. These are high-performing homes. The other thing that strikes is that the unregulated energy, the energy that seemed invisible by building regulations uh, and not regulated, is growing now in these homes because you know it's the energy used for appliances, cooking, and a bit of lighting, and that's about nearly 38% in passive houses, pretty high, and about a third in non-passive houses. 
So it, it really highlights the impact on non-regulated uh, you know, energy use as well. We then plotted uh, you know, predicted versus measured space heating. So now I'm comparing light with light. You can argue that you know, if you compare SAP with measured energy, SAP is our energy model, you're not comparing light with light, but this is now light with light. And still, there is hardly any correlation. And I think that's really interesting that these two are not correlating because there are other factors at play. Uh, and what we found was that the performance gap in space heating energy use is about 14 kilowatt hours per square meter in a passive house and double in a non-passive house. We then looked at this I call the killer graph because it's comparing measured space heating with measured air permeability. That's the basis for our building regulations. Because what it's saying is that if you are going to build airtight, your space heating should come down. That's not necessary. What we could do was statistically, we can only explain 18% of this because of uh, air tightness. So 82% of the space heating energy is, ex is explained by other factors which are not physical, which are probably how we use the heating, occupant behavior, and other things. And that, I think, is a very uncomfortable find, I think. Um, so then we looked at occupancy-related factors because obviously when you look at physical factors, you want to look at this. And we looked at three factors really. One was number of occupants because that tends to be seen as one of the indicators. One, who was occupying it. So how many, who, which means whether it's a retired couple or a, or a working family or uh, somebody who's there 24 seven. And the third was how long they are in for. So, uh, you know, uh, and then we kind of did statistical analysis on that to look at, uh, you know, what's the influence. We looked at number of occupants and measured energy use, and there's no correlation. And that's really interesting because many of our models are making this assumption. Uh, and actually, what we also found for additional occupants over our average 2.1 or 2.2, if you want to calculate what's the energy implication, it's about 6.7 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, having an additional occupant in a house and about 7.8 kilowatt hours per square meter per year for in a non-passive house. So similar, I think. So number of occupants did not correlate well with measured energy use. We then looked at occupancy type, which is, you know, stay at home with children, retired occupants, and working adults. So those were the kind, three types that were there in the database. Um, and interestingly, that has a significant effect. So who is occupying tends to determine what their behavior will be. And you can see, that staying at home are actually using much more energy than the others. And you can see the figures here. The third one is how long they are there for. Not just who, but how long. And this is uh, looking at people who are there just evenings only or evenings and weekends, most of the time or 24 seven. And as you would expect, that has the biggest effect on actual energy use. We've also plotted this same graph for the performance gaps, the difference between measured and predicted, and you get exactly the same trend. So the occupancy pattern or hours of occupation has a much bigger effect whether it's passive house or non-passive house, not number of people. Okay. We then ran our statistical model, I'm not going to go deeper into it, but essentially when we looked at these three factors for occupancy, we could explain 45% of the variation in measured energy use. So um, I think that's really interesting. What, what proportion of measured energy use is influenced by, by occupancy factors. Within this, we found occupancy pattern. So that's the coefficient which is the highest. Of occupancy pattern tends to have the biggest effect. Not number of occupants and not who it is, but how much are they occupying, so for what duration. I think that's really interesting. Okay, so all this is published now. It's in general papers. So if somebody wants them, I can kind of send them over. But um, yeah, but just to bring it to a close, I think some of the final thoughts I think from here are one that uh, what this is showing is performance gap is dominant, and as we try and build more of these low energy dwellings, we need to be mindful of the pitfalls. On average, we found about you know two meter cubes uh, per uh, meter square to be at least as an average gap. Uh, gap between measured and predicted uh, energy use was also pretty prevalent. Uh, space heating still, after all the innovation, does make up a significant proportion of overall energy use. And I think that's worrying, because we should be now designing buildings that don't use any space heating at all. With the changing climate, with technical innovation, with good management, we should not be seeing this. And this is still pretty high. 
uh, unregulated energy use is a significant proportion. And as building regulation choose to ignore this, this proportion will keep on rising and rising. Uh, occupancy related factors have a significant effect, especially the occupancy pattern. And I think that needs to be considered in models to avoid this kind of performance gap. And the recommendation would be that one, for when we analyze dwelling en energy use, the model should simulate occupancy in a more realistic manner. You know, not just use number of occupants or use floor area to determine number of occupants. And especially building regulations, which I think should make, firstly, BP mandatory, and secondly, we focus more on outcomes. I think that's quite important. So I'm trying to you know, do this study, bringing all this together in a, in a state of the nation report that I'm doing. And Chris is actually on our uh, board, on advisory board. And we're doing a survey of who's done what in UK in housing performance. And this is a live survey. We are creating a map of this. So if you're interested, please get in touch. I can send this link. Thank you very much.